Welcome to the Karen Kenny Show. Hey, you guys. Welcome to the Karen Kenny Show. I am super duper excited for today's episode because I get to have a conversation with one of my dear friends, Emily Aborn. So you might hear me refer to her on the call as Emmeline. <laughs> That's my little nickname for her. I love nicknames. It double amen hands to you fellow nickname lovers out there. So Emily, I'm going to give you a little bit of her quote unquote, like the professional uh, and the proper introduction, the proper uh, bio, and then I'll personalize it a little bit. So Emily Aborn is a freelance content writer. So she works for who she loves to work for is intelligent and motivated entrepreneurs. She's also the founder of She Built This, which is a community for women entrepreneurs and professionals. And she's also the host of a podcast of the same name, the She Built This podcast. Emmeline has been an entrepreneur since 2014. She has experience in running both brick and mortar businesses as well as online businesses. She's worked with a variety, a plethora, a ton, a shit ton, as I would say, <laughs> like 84 different industries. And that number is growing every week. That, that Those suckers like just keep changing. And she has worked, I think we talk about it on this episode, the variety of people that she has helped uh, with content writing and stuff like that. And she really loves to help people that have a big mission uh, to increase their visibility, to connect deeply with their clients and to bring their dreams and visions to life. So for fun, Emily loves nerdy word games, puzzles, reading, listening to podcasts. She says like they're going out of style and it's true. She's always telling me about, um, you know, not only the amazing podcast guests she's had on her own show, but all of the ones that she's listening to. And she's one of those thoughtful friends that if you, if she listens to something that makes her think of you or she thinks, oh my God, KK would love this. She shoots that sucker over to you. She also loves parading around the woods with her dog, Clyde. And we actually talk about Clyde on this episode. And she also loves having uh, cozy nights with her husband, Jason. So Emmeline and I first met, I think when I was a guest on her podcast, and I think I was so struck by um, just the, the warmth and the generous greeting, right? Her enthusiasm for me and having me on the show and her kindness. And it was just a really uh, fantastic um, first meeting. Do you know what I mean? Like she left an impression on me and I thought, man, this is a person who kind of knows how to welcome somebody into their world. And I wasn't surprised actually to find out that she is a kick-ass community builder. Uh, and this is one of the things, this is what we're calling this whole episode, right? Is community builds you up. So um, Emily and I are both huge fans of this concept of building people up rather than tearing them down, creating spaces where people can feel seen and heard and like they matter. And also of course, within those constructs and within those containers, right? finding uh, healthy boundaries, right? So when you're the leader of anything, we talk about this too, like about leadership in community and what that looks like. It's a fantastic conversation. It's a lot of fun. And that's one thing I can say about Emmeline is she's, she is, she's bubbly, she's warm, she's fun, she's smart. You know, she's just, she's just a delight to be around and to be friends with. And I hope you guys walk away from this episode, uh, not only um, knowing more about her, uh, finding out about the, the really cool event that she is hosting coming up in uh, September. On September 29th, they're doing an event uh, locally here in New Hampshire in Laconia called She Built This Lakes Region. And so I get to be one of the uh, entrepreneurs on the speaking panel, uh, along with Emmeline and a few other women, Jody Gallant and Karen Bassett and Kelly Chapman. So we're super duper excited about that. Those tickets are, are flying out, as, as Emily said, like hot cakes, like, like hot cakes at a diner. <laughs> So if you're interested in this amazing night of like networking and getting together and listening to other entrepreneurs and connecting, um, don't don't miss out. OK, you can just find it. I think it's just she built this dot org backslash lakes region. I'm almost positive that's what what it is. But you'll see the links also here in the show notes. Um, but you can come and experience Emily in person. Come uh, hang out, meet the panelists, talk, you know, see a bunch of um you know, feel the connection of community is what I'm trying to say. 
um, you know, at this event, if that appeals to you. If not, if you're somebody who lives far away and you can't be there in person, then please, I do hope that you enjoy this episode. I think you're going to walk away uh, just probably falling in love with Emily. She's she's a total peach. And like I said, she's a smarty pants. Um, she's also a writer. This is something that she, you know, would probably not put in her own bio. But Emily is also a writer. She loves to tell stories just like I do. Uh, and so come also, if you're, a, if you're a female entrepreneur, a woman entrepreneur, if you have a business um, and you want to join the online community, uh, it's on Facebook. Uh, everybody is welcome. It's called She Built This. And maybe I'll get to see you in there too. All right, you guys, enjoy the episode. Hey, you guys, welcome to the Karen Kenny Show. I'm wicked excited to be here today and to introduce you to my friend, Emily Aborn, who I call Emmeline. So you might hear me call her that. <laughs> so if you hopefully you just listened to the intro of the show, you heard all about her. And of course, we're going to dive into uh, who she is, what she's up to, why she's on the show. You guys know that I'm pretty um, picky in that way, right? I don't give up real estate a lot on my show. I only have guests on like once in a blue moon. And it's usually, I always say, it's people I'm either wicked curious about, people I love, people who I think are doing uh, important work in the world, making an impact in some way. And I want you guys, I want more people to know about them or know about their work and stuff like that. So welcome to the Karen Kenny Show. Well, when you say it like that, I, I am so, so happy to be here. Thank you. And super honored. Oh, you're so sweet. I know. And sometimes I think about that when I lead with, um, yeah, don't give up the real estate people. It's, not, like, an it's not an obligation to say, oh my God, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> oh. All right. So one of the things that I know we're going to talk about today is community. And I think we're calling this sucker, right? Like the, the commun community that, that builds you up or community builds you up. And there's a lot of reasons why um, we both believe that, I think. But I want to start off. Um, do you know who Gavin DeGraw is, the singer Gavin DeGraw? I mean, I haven't listened to him, but I know yeah. of okay. him. Yeah. So, yeah, he's got a great line in one of his songs that says, part of knowing where you're going is knowing where you're coming from. Totally. So I always like to start to ask people, and I can dive right in because I know that you've shared with me before that you were kind of like literally born into a community. So let's start off because I know that community building is a huge part of, I feel like, um, not only what lights you up, part of your, what I would call individual curriculum in A Course in Miracles would say, or part of what um, you feel purpose to do and call to do in this lifetime. But let's start back where why community even became even maybe consciously or subconsciously wicked important to you. So tell me a little bit of like who, who you were as a kid. What were you like as a kid? Were you always a little weirdo? Were you shy? Were you whatever? Like, tell me about you and how it all kind of began. Okay. So thank you for the question. <laughs> There's a lot of places I could start, but I think I'll start at the beginning. So when I say born into community, I mean this, my mom, my mom had me as a single mother and we lived with her best friend and their kids. And they were like, literally their church was called the community. So I just, I thought of that yesterday and I was like, oh my God, that is so funny and apropos. Um, but I think as a kid, so my mom tells this story. I, I could read when I was like three years old and everybody always wanted to be able to read like Emily um, because I would sit there and read stories to all the kids that we were living with. So when I was six, my mom was taking a medical terminology course and I remember, and she, she like confirms this memory. You know how sometimes you have a memory and, and your parent needs to confirm it for you sitting on the counter and quizzing her on her medical terminology course. So terms like hypothermia and um, words like that, like I knew the meaning to those words <laughs> at six years old. So I was that kid, right? I was like, um, yeah, I was that kid. <laughs> yeah. I was like really independent. Um, I was always like the ringleader, which, which didn't always make me the most popular person, but I always had like a plan for everybody and an activity for everybody. And we were all going to do it together and put on the circ. Like literally we put on a neighborhood circus. So, so I was you were like the director at all times. Yeah. You're the ringmaster, the yeah. leader. You got the ideas. Let's go make it happen. Yes. And yeah. I had three little brothers. So it was easy. You know, you just tell them to do something and they all follow right behind you. So 
<laughs> that's kind of how that's kind of how I lived my life. But I'll say this. I always as a kid, I don't remember like like a lot of I didn't like make believe my friend Elizabeth would like want us to play dress up and with these ponies and stuff. I didn't like that. Like I wanted to be an adult. And I remember one time we went to Sturbridge village and she like wanted us to act the part and like dress colonial. And I was like, I cannot take this seriously. <laughs> so like as a kid, I always wanted to be a grown up. I just wanted to be a grown up. And I, I spent a lot of time talking to grown ups. Like those were the people I had the best conversations with was grown ups. Yeah. So, all right. So there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack here. So first of all, tell me geographically where in the country, just so the listeners know, where were you, where did you grow up? Yeah. So I was born in Maine and then we moved to New Hampshire when I was eight. Okay. So, you know, what I notice is that, cause I'm married to like an only child. And one of the things that he often says to me is that, and he is a, he had a rich imagination. He was, he's an, he was an artist. He was, a, you know, he's a musician, professional musician, but he was an artist first. Um, he was always drawing and he, and he spent a lot of time alone. He has a very rich inner life, right? He's like one of those people where I was like, sweetie, I think you think you said that to me out loud, but you really just like said it like in here. My point being is that as an only kid, a lot of times, you know, when you have siblings, you're working things out like with siblings, you're playing with siblings. When you're an only child, you tend to spend a lot of time around adults and whoever your mother or your father, whoever you're living with might be around. But you sound like a kid who had siblings and other little kids around, but you still wanted that adult thing. So what I, I want to make a distinction here, um, because you did do circuses and you did put on these, you know, gala events or whatever, little kid events. So it's not that you weren't open to imagination. What I'm trying to get is like, you're like, oh, I didn't like to dress up and ride around on those stick ponies pretending I'm doing something. So tell, make the distinction for me there. What's the difference between putting on a circus where clearly there were not elephants and trapezes and stuff like that versus Elizabeth wants me to like dress up like this? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, I think as long as like the I think as long as it had like a goal or an outcome, oh. like I like 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 <laughs> I'm not kidding. Good. Okay. I liked playing teacher, but like you know, my brothers are the pupils and we have like the curriculum and the workbook and I'm going to be the teacher. So I think as long as it had like a goal or an outcome. So uh, now that I'm saying, I mean, I, I've always kind of had that, like wanting to start a business and wanting to be an entrepreneur. See, and that's and, where, yeah. that's what I'm yeah. trying to get at. So you weren't so much about play for play's sake. Like, this is what I'm hearing. Right. Like, Down I, the I wanted to have a goal and outcome <laughs> tangible. Like I, it, it's got to be purposeful in some way. So even as a young kid, and this is what I find fascinating because, you know, we do kind of come through, I always say we come through almost like, like I jokingly say, kind of like tofu, like, like a little bit of a blank slate, right? We come through with our worth fully intact with like who we are as a, as a perfect extension of love or child of God or whatever people want to say. And then the world kind of puts its seasonings and its flavorings on us, right? Our environment and stuff. But I also think that there can be a root of like, ego personality of just like how we are like some kids are more outspoken like were you bossy were you like a bossy circus leader or did you make suggestions were you diplomatic like or how did it how did and I because I want to hook on to the entrepreneurial part but so did you like being the boss and running the show I did yeah but I don't and I think in some circles I was considered bossy but I don't <laughs> think it was all like a lot of girls, I didn't get along with a lot of like girlfriends, but like a lot of, you know, people that were friends with my brothers, they would all like follow right along. So it it, it depends. It really, that answer depends. Well, let me ask you this. Did you like when others told you what to do? No. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So this explains a lot, right? So I am also the classic mumbler under the breath of you are not the boss of me, which explains a lot about that entrepreneurial drive in you. See, I think you're more of an intentional entrepreneur and we're going to talk all about that where I would say I'm an accidental entrepreneur. So you've known kind of since you were little that you had this particular kind of drive or pull towards this thing. So I want to talk about this though, because you say your mom raised you as like a single mom. Okay. And then, so what did that all look like? So you, what, did, well, Tell me just a smidge about the community. What was, quote unquote, this, quote unquote, the community? Uh, I'm doing air quotes for those of you who are listening and not watching. Like, what was their deal? Like, what was that all about? 
Yeah. So for, just to, for the record, she only raised me as a single mom until I was like three and a half and then she got married. Okay. Um, and then they had more babies. So then I, it was no that's longer. Where brothers, that's where the brothers <laughs> yeah. came from. It was so no longer. Were, yeah. You were an only child for like three and a half years. Okay. Yeah. I'm with bliss. you. Bliss. I tell you bliss. Bl- yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so the community was, as far as I can remember, it was a non-denominational church that was like very accepting of people, but they, they did at the same time that they were very accepting. They had like this really odd leadership. Like I, you know, I've heard stories from my grandmother and from my aunts, they had a very odd and controlling leadership uh, that was like, sort of like men control the women kind of thing. Um, and my mom was part of that for a long, long time. And I actually think that's how she met my dad. Uh, but we lived with a family that was in that. It was like my mom's best. It still is my mom's best friend. Um, but we lived with them during that time and they were all part of it. So it was kind of also like group discipline. Like everyone gets to discipline everyone's kids, you know, like everyone's oh, pitching like it takes in a and- village. Like it's <laughs> the, it takes a village approach. Fascinating. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then I, something that you had uh, shared one time and I always thought it was funny. So here you are. So like, you're like three and a half new, new guy comes on the scene. I can imagine where you like psyched to have a dad all of a sudden you were like, Oh, it's cool to have a dad and more than one parent. Right. Yeah, we all like the there were like four of us kids in that house. And I remember we used to always be like, Dave Millette is coming. Dave Millette is coming. Oh. Yeah, yeah, we liked him. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So he comes on the scene. So he's Dave is who you consider your dad. Yeah. So you even you have a biological father, but this is so did he adopt you? Did you take his name and stuff like that? Yes, he legally adopted me. Okay. All right. So here's something you said though. And I thought this was always funny. It's a spiritual menta. These beginnings, these origin stories are what fascinate me because so often in the work that I'm doing as a spiritual menta, you've heard me say this before, what people say to me, oh, so you only work with adults. I really wish you worked with kids because they could really use this work. And I say, well, technically I'm working with little kids in adult bodies who are still kind of hashing out stuff that, that, that went on, you know? So you said one time that my dad decided we weren't Catholic anymore. And I thought that was <laughs> wicked funny, like how somebody makes this decision, because why that's important, at least for me, or what's fascinating for me in terms of just talking about it now is because that decision led to a whole other world of churchy, whatever was going on. So can we talk a little bit about that and what, like, what did that look like? And then what environment did you move from like the community or whatever into this? Like what, like talk to me about this. I I so wish I could remember like being part of the Catholic church a little more. Um, I can't remember it that well. Like I remember I was doing, I was doing one of those steps that you do as a kid, like with the candles. And I, we, we we were walking down the aisle in a row and then like poof, Catholicism was gone. (laughs) So it was like a brief stint, you know, a little, a little dip into that, but I did love it. Yeah. (laughs) Um, so then we, my parents met this, this pastor in New Hampshire who was part of a organization called Foursquare. It's just a denomination of Christianity. And there's actually a lot of Foursquare churches in the world. There's like, I Googled Googled that shit last night. I was like, Oh, what is (laughs) happening right now? But anyways, go ahead. Foursquare is a Pentecostal. So you might relate it to like evangelical, um, church and in my particular church. So it's all about like the power of the Holy spirit. And like, that is like hugely, hugely, we'll call it rewarded. Um, so when somebody gets gifted with the power of the Holy spirit, like all kinds of things can happen. Okay. Let's stop right now. Let, yeah. I got to interrupt. So as soon as I hear gifted and that's really important, what it tells me is we're already setting up a hierarchy of specialness, mm. which immediately feels dangerous to me. It, it's immediately like, well, you were gifted, but sorry, sucker, you weren't. This so, is the right? thing. Okay. So, so keep and talking, I'll be, keep I'll be totally honest. Like there were times I, I will be completely frank. There were times I faked what I was supposed to do, like falling over, speaking in tongues, whatever the thing okay, was. Wait, yes. Okay. <laughs> wait, hold on. All, I, all of this, just like all my lights, all my pinball machine lights inside me just lit up <laughs> because you're, 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 t- I want details first of all, but you're, you're touching on so many important things that I think so many, why so many people 
leave quote unquote their church or religion i always say they throw out they throw out baby jesus with the bath water because their experience of god or experience of that that um unconditional love that that to me is what what the divine is right it gets so tainted and fucked up by the humans who are running the show so what i'm hearing too and the reason why what you just said i stopped you and interrupted is because what you're saying right now is a direct line to I think why perhaps community is so important to you mm. because even then the faking was to belong. The totally. faking was to not be singled out as, because if you're not doing those things then you weren't fucking gifted by the Holy spirit. So you're on the outside, you're immediately on the outside and everybody wants in. And so like, I'm thinking to myself, how much performing did go on? How much of it was truly, I'm having an honest experience, an aligned experience with my faith or the God of my own understanding, like for those people in that denomination or that church versus I need to do these things or I'm not going to get loved. I'm going to get picked on or the dreaded, you know how Southerners say like, bless your heart, right? It's this version of we're going to pray for you. Let me, we're going to pray for you, right? Because you need it. So speaking in tongues, roll what? Did you say on the floor? Like rolling on the floor, on the shaking, floor. dancing, you name it. Just, yeah. Can you, you're a writer, you're a fellow writer. Can you just set a little scene for those of us who are listening? Like what, how long, first of all, how long is the service? Like when you go into church, how often do we go to church? How long is the service? Okay. So church was on Sunday, but then we also had home fellowship group on Wednesday uh, council meeting met at our house on Tuesday and like worship team practice. I think it was like every other Tuesday. So there was a lot of, and then you might have like a Friday night once in a while. And then of course, like a Sunday barbecue. So church was a lot. Church was a lot. <laughs> okay. So there's a lot of churchiness. There's a lot of the church happening. Now, is your family involved? Are they, are they just parishioners or are they like in the church? Life? My parents were both pastors of this. Oh. Uh, they, st they still are. Yeah. Oh, they still are. Yeah. Your folks are still four square. Yes. Emily's outside the square. I'm I'm not, I'm no longer in the square. <laughs> All right. We're out of the box, isn't it? So we're out of the square box. Okay, fantastic. All right. So set the scenes. There's a lot of churchy going on. Churches usually, let's just pick a Sunday service. What's the vibe? What's the feel? Is there music? Is there incense? Like holy, like what, what is it? What's the vibe of the place? Yeah. So it starts at 10, um, but I think we usually got there at nine. And I would do like of this little, yeah, me did. and my friends would bring our nail polish, like in a little Ziploc baggie and we would exchange colors. So like everybody would like do like a little swap every week. So that's what we were doing. And then we would all be like having fun and, and playing in the back room, they called it. And then we would have to all come in. Like everybody had to be present for worship time, unless you got nursery duty, which was a pro move to get you out of the service. So like I opted for nursery duty often. But wait, usually in the nursery rooms though, there's a speaker. Piping. Oh, there was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's a speaker like piping in the events of what's happening. Now, is there a glass window? Can you see what's happening or are you just downstairs and you can only hear what's happening? You can only hear what's I'm happening. With, yeah. yeah, all right. Okay, yeah, keep yeah. going. This is fantastic. Yeah. Okay. So worship, I mean, it could go, you know, like technically it was like slated to go like 45 minutes, but if you, if something is happening, like an altar call or the spirit moves us, then it just goes on and on and on. Um, then they stop that, do the sermon. And then there's usually another like altar call, call to action at the end where okay. people come up and get prayer. Okay. That was going to say for the uninitiated, an altar call is like, if you feel like you need like the Holy spirit to help you, or you need to be prayed upon or like, like you're healed, like all of that yeah, stuff. So exactly. So in your now adult opinion, how much, how, hmm, I don't know if you can actually answer this question, but I'm curious to know, do you think you were like the only faker? Like, do you think you were the only one doing stuff? Or do you, did you know people who were like really feeling it? Like they were into it. Like, uh, oh yeah. Deep. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't I don't actually know who else. And when I say fake, like I do, only did that sometimes, like sometimes I just stand there with my arms crossed, but then I felt like I was going to hell. So, oh. <laughs> yeah. So so here's the thing in, in, in Catholicism, 
you know, only it, it's pretty pointed out that only the priest gets to access God, right? Like only the priest has access, but in Christianity and especially in evangelical um, denominations, everybody can access him. And if you can't, then that means like, you don't have a relationship with him, you know? So it was kind of always that, like you talk about Catholic guilt. I feel like this was worse. Like, I feel like this was worse than Catholic guilt because it was literally like something is wrong with me that I'm not feeling this. Yes. Yeah. But I'll tell you what I did feel. I loved, I was, I sang on the worship team with my mom and I loved that. And I loved, I actually really liked the music. Um, like that really, mo- it, it, I don't love the words of the songs. Like I look no, back yeah, and I'm like, yeah, can we I not be more creative than this? Yes. Like These are terrible lyrics, but the, the, the whole feeling of music really, really like, I loved that feeling. Um, and like the collectiveness of singing was just really a beautiful thing. Well, so the, the, here's the thing though, the singers, the ones who sing, that was its own little community. The choir is always its own little group within the larger group, you know? So that was like its own little community. And there's something really powerful, you know, I can't, oh, I wish I could, I wish I could access little guys in my brain in the file, the, the Dewey Decimal system are searching the files right now. I can't remember who said it. Uh, I know Ashwaran, my meditation teacher, has has said it, but I don't know who he was quoting. And he was saying basically that, uh, and I know it's also in A Course in Miracles, they kind of talk about how whoever is, um, when you hear like a song that moves you, that is like the memory of God. When you when you mm. read it, like we're both writers, we're both, you know, in, do gateless, uh, gateless writing stuff. When you hear another person read their work and you're just like oh and like you're so moved by that so they would say like that great art great poetry great um prose uh dance like things that move us like when you see a sunset or you hear a baby laugh that's like to me i call it it's like an echo it's almost like an echo of god's love so i love that beyond whatever the words Right. Because I know that there's some there's some Christian songs sometimes and I'm like, oh, no, like, don't, oh, no, <laughs> I was with you until that lyric. You know, I was in the moment. I was feeling like some good energy, like worship music can be beautiful, just like old gospel music can be beautiful. But then there comes a thing where you can feel the human intervene with their judgment and it pulls you out. of. So I think there's something really beautiful that you are feeling moved by the energy and the spirit of the music which to me, I think the divine shows up that way. And I know, cause I, I mean, I know, cause I know my own experience of music, but I think it's one of the ways that, I think that art is one of the ways that we can, we show love and we experience it, right? And then I also wanna say too, cause um, I love that you were able to find some sort of resonance, even within a community where maybe you were like looking around a lot of the time, like what the, fuck is happening right now because some part of you it wasn't making sense to you and I think this happens to a lot of us like I was a Catholic kid growing up I just remember like sometimes just hearing things and being like that makes no sense and it's and it's not like we were encouraged to question things okay I want to clear one thing up it it's not that it didn't make sense I just went al- like I kind of just assumed I had to go along with it. So I I I don't want to use the term brainwash, but I I just wasn't able to think for myself if that makes sense. Well, how old are you at this point? Yeah, like on you know like up till I was 16 probably. Yeah. But I really didn't and when I did start to ask questions, the response is always like you just have to have faith. Yeah, but so- that's Right. So, so I want to, I I'm going to push back a little bit against something that you just said. When you said you didn't know how to think for yourself, I think you really knew you're not a kid at like three and four years old directing circus plays because you didn't have ideas and you didn't have your own inner authority and agency. You knew what you wanted to do, but you have to remember at the eight from between the ages of zero, like when you're still third trimester in the womb to seven, um, you are in a high state of hypnosis you are in the brainwave state of alpha and theta which is when you are the most highly suggestible so when you say i was brainwashed uh, we we don't have to go to that extreme (laughs) but you were certainly conditioned to be a part of this thing and how things work and the way it goes and so um 
there's a reason why like a kid at seven or so will be like, and if there's little kids in the room, block their ears right now, right? But if you're listening with this on, like, I just want to warn you, tell them like, so um, there's a reason why like a seven-year-old will be like, oh my God, it's for Santa. I can't wait till he comes, you know, brings me presents. And and then at like eight or nine, maybe when the, when the faculty start to adjust, the logic starts to happen, they go, wait, how can he get all around the world in one night? Like, fit down the chimney, mommy. Like that doesn't make sense, right? So there's a thing. But if you've been told, which you were, don't question this. And here's the thing that like shocks me. It doesn't shock me, kind of annoys me. Let's just put it that way. But it, fr it frustrates me because what I heard you saying is, um, you said it pri prior and then you just confirmed it, is they said, they just tell you, you just have to have faith, but they don't tell you how. Mm. They don't tell you how one builds that relationship. They don't tell you how one comes to have faith. And what they really mean is have fucking blind faith. They don't mean have faith, which is where I come from. And I'm not saying I'm right, but faith for me is often built through these tiny bits of evidence, these tiny bits of ex personal experience. So it's kind of just like them saying, take my word for it. And you're just kind of like swinging in the dark going, I don't even know like pinata, you know, when you can't hit the pinata. Like, I don't even know what I'm doing, but I know I'm supposed to be doing something. Um, I think one of the practices that was supposed to help you build faith was to like read the Bible, for example, um, which we we definitely had to do. Like we had to be like locked in our rooms <laughs> to read the Bible. And I was like, and I'll read Anne of Green Gables. Okay. <laughs> But that was, you know, so like hypothetically, maybe that was my fault. Because I yeah. Read. Okay. Look, I, I think I, I could literally, we could do the whole episode on my fascination yeah, yeah, yeah. with yeah, this yeah. because I think it explains a lot. And I think that the part of you, the part of you that had autonomy and agency and authority in your life, she was just like waiting for her moment. I think it's probably why in some ways you built communities like later and why you do. And again, we're going to get to that. So the other thing I think was really interesting about your childhood that I found out is that um, it sounds like I did like a search on you secretly, <laughs> like you told me um, that you were homeschooled because that definitely affects how kids are shaped and turn out. I, I dated a homeschooled kid, you know? I'm and sorry. He, no, no, no. I think it was, uh, he was, he was brilliant. He was brilliant. Um, but he was like a little grown up, like in a little body. Like he, he was like, also his dad was a, you know, meditation teacher. So he started meditating at five. So he was like next level, but talk to me about homeschooling and how do you, how do you think that shaped you? Uh, well, it didn't make me smart. Uh, I can tell you that. Um, my, I used to go over my friend Beth's house a lot. She was my fellow homeschool buddy. And we would like, we had like homeschool videos. So we would watch video school, um, which is fascinating. Like that was our teacher. I remember she had like this giant, like eighties bow on the front of her thing. And Beth and I would just giggle about her. Outfits. All right. So but wait a minute. So put in context, how old are you? Um, so this is, so I didn't go to school until I was 14. So everything, like, I think I met Beth when I was eight, we probably started like homeschooling together. I mean, we didn't even homeschool together. This was just like once in a so while. Tell me, so let's break it into grades to make it easier for people. So from grade this to grade this, I was homeschooled every, every grade until age 14, which is freshman year of high school for me. Oh my God. So you're homeschooled your whole life and then you make your high school debut. Oh yes. <laughs> okay. Wait. So I'm thinking of homeschooling, like how it is now where the parents are like, the people are wicked involved and they're, they've got like, you know, they're making sure you still have activities with other children. So you don't, you know, so you get, you learn how to share and do shit like that. Teamwork, sports, whatever. But there's like curriculums. You're telling me you were basically plunked in front of a, a TV so that was so when when we first started, like when we were real young and we lived in Maine, my mom was home all the time. And so she she did like teach us the basics, you know, gotcha. and my grandmother did a great job. Like my grandmother would like give me these like one minute math sheets and quiz me. My grandmother was a math teacher. So oh. she like made sure that Emily knew math. And, and I was always a reader. Like I loved reading. So we, we had, I had that going for me. My my brothers didn't love school. They didn't love any of that. Um. 
when we moved to New Hampshire, my mom got a job and she worked like I, I if it, if my memory serves me correctly, it was at least four days a week. So like homeschooling was really kind of self directed, which in a, it, what that translates to is like, OK, I'll answer the questions in the book, but I'm just going to look in the teacher guide and find the answers to the questions and and do my homework that way. Um, I didn't like it was very easy to pass from one grade to the next. You just had to read an age appropriate level of like a paragraph and do like a, a math worksheet and then show your workbooks, which was easy because I like copied a lot of mine from the teacher's guide. <laughs> this is, all, this is I, uh, okay. This is like cracking me up. This yeah. So, fantastic. so when I went to high school, like this is, this is the extent of it. When I got to high school, I was a little confused, like why X and two would be in the same like why that, how could that be one equation? Like why are letters and numbers together on the page? <laughs> this isn't how it works. So like that's sort of where I started at. And I, I remember my first history test, I didn't like know how to study and then like pass a test. So my first history test, I got a 27 and I was like, I don't think that's going. The fact that you remember the exact number tells me how traumatizing it probably yeah. was. It's like, like, oh my God. I think God. we have a problem here. You so said this we have a problem. And this is my disconnect. I learned math quick. Um, there were a lot of things I picked up really quickly, but what I sh fall short on is like, I don't know science very well. I don't know, like, I don't know like the, the basis of science. Um, and I don't know a lot about social studies and I don't know a lot about history and like things like that, like basic kind of fundamental things that you learn yeah. in school. I, d I kind of just missed yeah, so that that's really interesting. So not only are you trying to play catch up scholastically, right? Like in the learning thing, but what's it like to be plunged into cliques and groups of kids and hormones and people and the hustle and bustle of hallways and like extracurricular activities? Like how was the high school experience then? Like what were there like mean girls? Was it like you didn't fit in? Like, because I think this is part of it, right? what we're talking about today. Was it a community that built you up, Emmeline? You should know that it was a very small school. Like, I think my freshman class was 25. But then by the time I graduated, there were six of us. Um, so when, when I was a senior, I graduated with six of us. Beth, thank goodness, Beth and I went to school together. Wait, she where was, did you go to school? Where was you uh, it was called, Mil it's no longer in existence, but it's called Milford Christian Academy in Milford, New Hampshire. Oh, so it was a Christian school. We're yeah. still in the Christian loop. Okay. All right. Keep continue. Um, so, so like I said, like, thank goodness, Beth and I went to school together because Beth was cool. Like everybody oh. loved Beth. My first year, I did not say a peep. Like I was like quiet, shy, skinny, ugly. <laughs> like oh. I had it all going for me. And I did get bullied by these two girls. Like, I don't know what their deal was, but they they were mean, mean girls. Everybody else, it, I couldn't, I, I don't even remember. I couldn't care less because I was just kind of like, I just must get through. <laughs> but Beth was my saving grace. Like she and I were, she kind of like helped me be like a little cooler, you know? Um. When, when I was in 10th grade, Beth went actually to public school and I started becoming really close friends. Like a lot of people left the school. So then like our class was really, really small. And then high school was a blast. Like then it was so much fun. I had Anna, I had Rochelle, we had our friend Tim and we just like ruled the school. You know, it was <laughs> awesome. Like from 10th grade on, um, so I had girls, the mean girls left too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they were definitely like, and there were just like, you know how high school boys are, but like in, in my school, like nobody stopped them because nobody got the disgusting humor. So like stuff would just happen and they would say things and mm. nobody said anything because they didn't know any better. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, so so I really loved after that year, I really loved high school. And it was like, I flipped a switch. Like I was super shy and quiet and like literally people would, take my lunch like I feel like oh they mind. would like ask me for my sandwich my mom made really good sandwiches and so people would be like can I have your sandwich and I was like yes you may <laughs> so hungry. <laughs> I'm sure I mean I had like a hollow leg so I don't think <laughs> hunger was ever a problem um but in 10th grade this kid named Clyde we were taking like one of those self Did you said Clyde yes <gasps> I know so 
And this kid named Clyde sits next to me. I remember like exact, oh, we had also switched to uniforms. So like before we could wear whatever we wanted, which was mm. worse. Like, let me tell you, that was worse. Cause I was like, I don't know what to wear um, without getting made fun of. Cause I looked like I was like from the prairie and all these other kids <laughs> oh are super God. cool. <laughs> so, so then we got uniforms and th that was cool. Like I was like, I can do uniforms. I can match like the color under the uniform to my sneakers. Like I'm all good. So Clyde sits next to me. We're taking like one of these little like um, placement tests. And he's like, you know, you are a really bubbly, friendly girl. And I was like, I haven't said anything to you. But like, it was like he got this like vibe that I didn't even know I had inside me. And then from that moment on, I was like, yes, I am. <laughs> Let my light shine. Yeah, yeah. It was awesome. And and I always remember that. Like, I remember his name, Clyde. I never met, saw him Is again. Is that why you named your dog Clyde? We didn't name our dog Clyde. He came with okay, the name look Clyde. S-T-O-T-J. I know. That's I know. <laughs> team on the job. There are no mistakes. Okay, that's fantastic. I did not know that. I love that little surprise story. Um, so, because here's the power of somebody else seeing you and reflecting it back to you. You're like, he didn't even hear me say anything, but he sensed me. That's what you're, that's what we're hearing here is that he recognized something in you and then he was awesome enough to reflect it back to you. And that gave you permission to swing open the saloon doors and be like, I'm here, let's go, <laughs> you know? Because anybody who knows you knows that you are, you have that bubbly, like energy, like effervescent, you know, excited about things. So what a gift Clyde gave you. Yeah. Clyde and a gift that and I don't think, them. I don't think my teachers would agree with you. <laughs> they were like, can we stop her from I mean, talking? Like, well, it's like you got uncorked. <laughs> yeah. It was like you know, little, little house on the prairie girl, little Laura Ingalls was like <laughs> set free. So this is like so fantastic. So high school teaches you quick. And then we move on. Let's talk about this entrepreneurial spirit, because I know one of the things is that you have had like a brick and mortar store. You do work online. You do all these things. You have a community. You have a podcast. We'll get into all those. But like, I know it sounds like you moved around a lot, not just like physically homes, but also in your jobs and stuff like that. So I'd be fascinated to hear like what your first job was and then things like, like what was your worst job? What was your favorite job? And then how did you come to step into, um, you know, where you are now. So just kind of take us on that journey a little bit as an entrepreneur and as a creative and stuff. Okay. I definitely won't go through all 42 jobs. No, 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 no. Just, the high, <laughs> give, just give us snippets, a little highlight yeah. of how we got here. My first job was a place called the Pizza Barn. And I, I want to tell you why I quit because I think that says everything. Like, <laughs> I loved working at the pizza bar. I loved having a job. I loved working. I thought that was so fun. And it was a little bit of like a um, seedy environment. So like I kind of learned like, I well, we won't okay, even let, wait, let me, let me, let me interrupt NASA a clarifying question. Did you love making money or did you love having a place to go or did you love the connection to people? Like what were the elements? I think all of that, but I just loved like being busy and working and like, you know, doing something. Um, so, so my job mostly was to make sub sandwiches and one guy comes in and like huge new England guy, right. Comes at New Hampshire guy, uh, comes in and orders a steak and cheese with extra mayo. So I'm putting the mayo on, put it through the cooker comes out and he's like more mayo. So I have to scrape off the steak that I already put on, add more mayonnaise, put the steak back on, put it back in the cooker. He goes little more mayo. So I have to Why do this. Why couldn't you just put the mayonnaise on top? I'm curious. Is it the protocol of how sandwiches are made? I think you have to like heat up the mayo with the stuff. Yeah. Mm. But it was that third extra mayo <laughs> that I was like, this is disgusting. Like this is the most disgusting sandwich. And I cannot feed somebody this. Like I can't be part of this problem for this man's heart. <laughs> so I quit my job. I was like, this is gross. And I'm not doing this. And so that was my first. Um, and I don't, I'm trying to think of what my second job was. I don't think I worked again until college. So well, that was, you, oh, you like, yeah. yes, I did. Yeah, I worked at Eastern Mountain Sports. My whole oh, family yeah. worked at, my whole family yes. worked at Eastern. Yes. <laughs> my whole family, Jason, like we were EMSers. Um, so I did, I went and applied for a customer service job at EMS and I had never had a job interview before. Like at the pizza place, I was just like, I need a job. And he's like, great, you're hired. It's 525 under the table. 
<laughs> and at EMS, I had to go through a job interview because my dad's like, they're hiring in customer service. You should, you should try for it. That was like answering phones. Sure. So I go and apply and the lady asks me questions. And like, I remember one of the questions was, is the customer always right? And I was like, um, yes, yeah. <laughs> no, no. no. <laughs> but you should pretend they are. <laughs> anyway, I did not get the job. <laughs> so they put me instead in like the picking and packing, which was like a factory kind yeah, of place. Like man, you have yeah. to like scurry up ladders. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So I did that for a long, long time. And I did eventually move myself up to customer service and then also copywriting and marketing in EMS. So I worked at EMS three times and in three different capacities. So that's a, that was a good, like, that was a good formative experience. Yeah. Uh, my worst job was this place in Ohio. I was, I was in my soft, uh, sorry, junior year of college. And I was looking for a job and I applied at this restaurant that my roommate worked at and my trainer, her name was Heather. She <laughs> Heather, had, if like, you're listening. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, her ponytail really irritated me. Like, I don't know what it was about her hairstyle, but I was like, it's so disturbing. Like it's too perfect or something. <laughs> um, but she, like the way they had you write the orders, it was like, instead of just like writing Pepsi, you had to write like a P and instead of writing Coke, you had to write a C. And like, there was just a very definitive way of doing the orders. And I was always messing it up. I just couldn't get it right. Like instead of like you would think hash browns is like an HB, but I do like HS. And they were like, we don't know what your order says, you know? So I was always getting the wrong You're thing. You're making up your own yeah. word, your own code, your own way. Mm -hmm. So after two weeks of it, I was like, I can't do this and I don't want to do this. So I quit. And I remember like, it was like a, it was a bad moment to quit. It was like, you know, when you're in the weeds as a waitress, Oh yeah, I, I was know. like in the weeds and I was like, Bye. <laughs> like, so you like left mid shift? Yeah. I mean, oh, I think it was just, I know, I know. And Heather, you know, poor Heather, like probably had to pick up my slack because she was like my trainer. So oh I don't feel God. proud about that moment, but that was definitely one of my, <laughs> my worst jobs. Um, and I, and then like the last, after I graduated college, I worked for a lot, a lot of chiropractors, like lots, like that was almost my niche. Um, and I went to school. <laughs> yeah, really. I went to school for health education. So I just found myself in a lot of chiropractic offices again and again and again and again. So did chiropractic offices lead to the mattress store? Like how did, so how, like, talk to me about this because I think it was at the mattress store when you really started to crave community and stuff, right? Definitely. Can you take us on that journey. Yeah. So my last chiropractic office, which was coincidentally also my first, I went back there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so that was in 2014. And it was for this lovely woman who's actually been a panelist on one for she built this. Her name is Jenny Brock. And she's built a really successful practice called Spinal Corrective Center in Amherst. Um, the hours were really hard on my body. Like I am not a morning person and you had to be there by 645. Yeah. And then you worked until 10 and then you took a break and then you came back and worked until like eight o'clock at night. So it was the, I mean, I was in like a little bit of like a haze all the time, you know, oh, it's a long but, day. but at the same time, you can't not be a, you, it was really hard to be around Jenny and not be doing what you were dreaming of doing. Like, she's one of those people that like, if you're not following your passion or living out your dream after a while, you're just like, I can't. Like she's so happy in what she's doing mm -hmm. that you're like, I need to find that and go do that. So she so it, it was in, it's inspired you to kind of like ask yourself, well, what's my version of this? Exactly. Yeah. I got yeah. You. Yeah. So in 2014, um, I, Jason and I had been talking about it for a little while. Oh, who Jason is. So Jason's know. my husband. Okay. Um, we, I had worked at a organic mattress store in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I know it sounds crazy, but mattresses actually have like a ton of toxins, like formaldehyde and all, I'm not going to get into it all, but they're actually like laden with toxins. Yeah. So I worked at the store in North Carolina and I saw the business model and I was like their marketing person. So I had done like a lot of the marketing 
And I was like, I could do this. And I think I could do it better. Like I could make it feel even more cozy in here and like up level the customer service and give people cookies and coffee when they come in and just like make it an experience, you know, not just yeah. like going in and buying a mattress. I'm already seeing the, the breadcrumbs, the divine breadcrumbs <laughs> that have been laid. Like, yes, go ahead. So we, so I, we talked it through and we decided to go for it and we kept it really quiet. Um, like I worked for Jenny March of 2014 to September of 2014. And we like, were working on our business and our business plan that whole entire way. And so for that business, it was brick and mortar. We took out a really, really big loan, um, to put it all together. And it was stunning. Like everything inside was just the moment you walked in, it was beautiful. People were coming, people would come in and be like, my wife told me I have to come in and get what the name of the paint colors are because we love your paint colors. Like it was just a very, it felt really good in there, but <laughs> I hated it. <laughs> oh, so tell us, tell us, at, so, yeah, tell us why. At first I didn't hate it, but in my mind, this mattress store was going to be kind of like a coffee shop. Like people were going to be coming and going and it was going to be like a you know, like exciting. And a mattress shop does not work that way. Like people rarely come in because people only need mattresses once every 10, 20 years. Can I, so it's right. just, Can yeah. I ask you something? I know I'm interrupting. So I want to make a connection here though. So, but you had already worked in a mattress store. Mm -hmm. So you kind of knew this on some level, but some other part of your brain was like, but I can do it differently. Is this what mm -hmm. I'm saying? So totally right. So you had envisioned how with your heart and your design and your intention and your love, you were going to create like the friends, like, you know, like the, like the friends coffee shop, you're going to create like the mattress store where people want to go. Well, I'll say this. Our other business idea was a coffee shop slash laundromat, which is brilliant if anyone still wants to take that one. Right. Um, but this made so much sense on paper that we went for it, you know, so it was kind yeah. of like one of those things like, but you're right. I did. That's exactly what I thought I could create. And I met a ton of people through that store. So I'm really grateful. I would never like trade that experience. I learned so, so much. Um, but it was hard on us working together for sure. Like Jason and I, as business partners, it was really challenging because he was doing things I knew that he didn't love. And I was doing things that he knew I didn't love. And we had to kind of like watch each other suffer through those things. Like yeah. I worked every weekend and then he would work on Mondays and Tuesdays because he went back to painting and I worked at the store full time. So we were like ships passing in the night. You know, we both kind of like had to do our own thing. So it was it was a challenging time for us, but I'm super happy we went through it because it made us better communicators and stronger together. Um, but it was one day really. Well, it, it was a couple of factors, but like I would go, so we have all these like lovely mattresses, right? This beautiful store. And I would go lay in my office <laughs> on the floor, which but my office was not a lovely color. It was this awful green. And I would lay on the floor and just like cry because I felt so alone. Aww. I just felt like very, very lonely. <laughs> it's so sad when I think about it, but, and I was part of stuff. Like I was part of the chamber and B and I, and I, I did a few things, um, but it was actually through that, that I was like, there's got to be something better than this, you know? And so we, we talked it out and we, I mean, things were kind of going downhill in the actual like revenue. Um, and we had tried a lot of different things. And so I met with somebody from the SBDC and she was like, Which you know, the what? yeah, the small business development center, it's a free consulting service in New Hampshire. And she said, Emily, you really need to treat yourself like this is your first year in business and like put on your baby business owner bonnet and, and big girl pants and like get out there and just go make connections. And she's like, make connections in the same industry as you. And when she said that, I was like, I'm just going to meet everybody. <laughs> so I just kind of started like, and I did crazy things. Like I would host, um, networking is, events, okay, but this is all in the mattress store still. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Go ahead. I would host like networking events in my mattress store. I would host chamber workshops in my mattress store. Like if anybody needed a venue, I was like my mattress store. <laughs> but wait, let's go under, let's go underneath that though. What okay. were you really craving? I mean, you said one of the things you said, so I'm, 
you're not even this is the funniest part you're not even laying on a mattress you just lay on the floor in the I back know. and you cry a little hat out because you feel so alone so when you when you're like doing the networking some people might be listening and thinking oh because she's trying to make connections so people will refer to her but i think there's a deeper more primal thing that's also happening as a call of the hat so can we dive under that a little bit I definitely think I I wanted connection, like genuine connection with people. Like also when you're talking to customers, it there is a level of there was a great level of connection, but I was kind of trying to sell them something. It's transactional. Yeah. Which yeah. has a different feel. Yeah. So um there was that and there was a very strong feeling like like Jason and I had planned to do this for like 15, 20 years. So there was this sort of feeling like oh my God, is this what I'm going to be talking about for 15 to 20 years? Like, like you, so you have an aha, you have like you yeah. have an epiphany of like, oh my God, I don't think this is like my purpose on the planet. I don't think this is my thing. And then I was like, I don't even think I care about health at all, except for my own. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning like helping other people, like all these things that you, you know that you went to school for and then the chiropractor and like all these things. And it's like, so as we would say, light dawns over Marblehead, right? And it's like, oh my God, like, uh, so now what? So as you're talking to people now though, what? and you're having these events, is there like one moment when it dawns on you? Or is it like a slow creeping up feeling of like, I don't think this is that, or this is it, or? I think, I think there were a lot of like, customer things happening too that really solidified it like it was just like are these the kind of complaints I have to be dealing with and then like as mattresses get older that's just gonna keep getting worse so there was a there was a lot of factors in that um and I think it was a slow build I do remember when I first got the idea for she built this like the actual event like like I said, I was hosting events in my store and I had met a whole bunch of women entrepreneurs I was like I didn't even know there were so many entrepreneurs out there. First of all, like I was just in my own little bubble. Um, and I had a coffee with Kristen Hardwick. And I remember walking away being like, I don't think she likes me. And she walked away being like, I don't think she likes me. <laughs> and that was not true. Um, but I'm listening to that, that podcast, uh, how I built this, I think with Guy Raz, mm -hmm. that was like, right when I started listening to podcasts. And I was like, oh my gosh, we should bring in the voices of like local women, New Hampshire entrepreneurs to like inspire people that are just like right in our community, building the thing and sharing their stories. So that's how the first, I texted Kristen and I was like, Hey, want to do this event with me? And that was how the first, she built this started. The first she built this event. Yes. All right. So let's, let's back up. Okay. So you're, you're, you're going to these, so the SBDC, right? They say to you, you got to get out there, start talking to people, connect with others, network, whatever. You start doing this, you have a series of, of epiphanies, and you're also starting to listen to podcasts and stuff. So I would say you're expanding your consciousness, you're expanding your awareness, and you're also getting to know yourself better. So you're having these moments of self-knowledge and saying, ooh, I don't like that. Ooh, I do like that. I want more of this. I want less of that. And so you kind of put together, we should start to like bring together local women who are getting stuff done, like some, some whatever. And so you put together what's called She Built This, which it becomes an event before a community. Is that what I'm hearing? Correct. All right. So break that down a little bit. So, and because I want you to tell us all about what She Built This is, but where did the name come from? And then like the first event is like a gathering or a panel, like what is happening? Yeah. So I emailed uh, NPR and asked if I could use the name how she built this, which Kristen's like, why would you ask them that? That's so fantastic. But I did. And they said no. <laughs> so then I used, I just did she built this, which is fine. And now it's trademarked and, and registered and all that. So we're good there. Um, But that, that was how I came up with the name. Like, I just thought it was like brilliant. And I'm like, well, this is what I want to do is help like bring more of these stories out and bring women together around these stories. So the first event was a panel of three local women um, sharing and everybody like in that room, I think we had capacity for 180 and we got like 165. And I'll say Kristen and I didn't even really like we didn't even really know what we were doing marketing an event. 
Sure. It was not, there was no plan. There was no strategy. It was just sort of like, this is what we're doing. Do you guys want to come? <laughs> yeah. Like let's and put so, it out there. Yeah. So that was really impressive. And, and people had really wonderful things to say about it. Like they were very inspired and they left feeling connected and that sense of community. So I was like, well, it would be nice if everybody after the event could like stay in touch, you know, and stay mm. connected. So I started a Facebook group and it was just for New Hampshire women entrepreneurs. And it was called chicks that mean business. <laughs> Oh, animal line. Uh, right, keep going. Keep, uh, just, yes, okay. And of course, after a after a year of that, I changed the name to she. I was like, oh, everything should be the same name, Emily. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so, so Jason and I did end up closing the mattress store. And during that time, I got my real estate license. And then oh, I, yeah. the, and yeah. then I learned after like two showings, I was like, this is not for me. <laughs> but again, the experience of getting the license was actually very good. Like it was a very good experience. Um, and then I started doing virtual assisting for people. Mm. And I had a ton of clients. Like I had so many clients. Jason was like, when we were closing the store, he's like, I think you need to go and get a real job. Like, I think now is going to be the time that we should figure out what you want to do and you should like start a career. And I was like, yeah, good thinking. Like entrepreneurial is too risky for me. I can't yeah. do it. Yeah. So I'm looking at all these jobs and stuff and I take on a couple of virtual assistant clients. And by the time we were closing, I had so many clients that it was like an actual business. And so I was like, well, I can't go get a job now. Sorry. <laughs> all these people are depending on me. Um, and then that transitioned into like what I'm doing now after just a couple of tweaks and pivots of things that I did not want to be doing like people's spreadsheets and MailChimp. Yeah. So going from like a VA and doing like a bunch of things. So now you've really kind of found, uh, because you are a creative. I mean, any kid that loves to read and loves books and loves stories and loves words is a little kid. We tend to, um, you know, like to stay in a creative space. So you doing the work that you do now as a, as Emily Aborn, as a content creator, um, you know, I'm not surprised that 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 has come back around because basically you're helping people with words, right? You're helping people use their voice and 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 all that. We can dive more. I don't want to say what your business is to you. We can talk more about that. So, do you think that she? So you have basically the VA stuff, right? So this is your now the the entrepreneurial journey begins with the mattress store, then like very blip on the screen, real estate, whatever. And then it's like, okay, I stopped being a VA. I, I start helping other people. And at the same time, the She Built This events were already happening, right? So She Built This kind of came first? Yes. Yeah, it did. Okay. And so t tell us about the, because we'll talk about She Built This, and then we're gonna, I want to talk about um, your other services and what you do and what it's like to have these kind of two facets, uh, you know, it, as a business owner. So Tell me about She Built This, like the group, the events, like just so the listeners, because somebody out there, I know that, you know, they recently did a scientific study. And one of the things that we know, first of all, those of us who are especially solopreneurs, right, which I have been for over 20 years, uh, an entrepreneur who works usually by themselves. And we might have contractors or people we bring in for specific jobs, but by and large, we're the business. OK, and that's also, I think, you. Um, but with um, She Built This. It's really community driven and being a solopreneur, being an entrepreneur can feel really lonely. And then this, re and that's just on a business level. But in a recent scientific study, they were saying that, I don't even know what the percentage is, but it's really high that people are saying they feel so lonely. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we're at a point in time where we are more connected than ever through electronic devices, but we are more disconnected than ever from ourselves, source, spirit and each other. So can we talk a little bit about um, really the heartbeat of She Built This and, and what it really is in case somebody wants to join because they're feeling like they are lonely or, or they could be lonely in their business or in their life and they want to make connections with other like-minded women. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so it's really, it's a community for women entrepreneurs and professionals. Like even if you, you know, I believe as, in any job that you're in, you can be entrepreneurial in the workplace and you can have that kind of like, you can be entrepreneurial in your life. You know, it just simply means that you want to sit in the driver's seat basically and 
of your life or your business. Um, and so it's a community for, I always say positive because like we really are about lifting one another up and staying positive. Like there's a lot of negativity out in the world and I don't want it to be just like a breeding ground for more of that. So it's a community where I never want, like, I never want anyone to feel alone in their business. I never want them to like not know where to go for answers or not know who they can reach out to or not even feel like they have someone to reach out to. And so like, that's why the space was, is really so important to me. Um, but also giving people a place where they do belong, no matter who they are. Like, I don't want you to, to raise your hands and speak in tongues. If that doesn't make you comfortable, you know, (laughs) going back to the beginning. So we're talking, so, um, she built, this is an online space, right? It's a Facebook group and community. So tell us some of the details and then tell us a little bit about kind of like the events that spring from that or the connections and workshops. Cause I know you do so much and trying to help people feel connected. And, um, again, I mean, I think we've made this point, but so much of this, I feel like it has been inspired out of your own desire, like from those days of like crying alone on the floor of the mattress store and being like, there's got to be more to it than this. I feel called to a higher purpose. And I want to walk along this journey with other people who kind of know how I feel and get it. Yeah. Um, and I, I, there are a lot of opportunities for people to connect and it's kind of one of those things where it's like dive in as much as you want or as little as you want, you know, there's, it's not, it, you can go at your own pace. Um, but kind of like the things we do regularly are workshops and, um, doing coffee chats or coffee conversations. Can you like give me, give me a few like titles of different workshops. Like what kind of workshops do you guys do? Okay. Um, anything from how to set your pricing with confidence Mm -hmm. to one that we have coming up tomorrow, which is soul sales, which is all about like learning about your sales archetyped from like your very first, from when you were first born. So I kind of like expand, like we take it a lot of different directions. Um, we did one on decision-making, which was really, really popular, Mm -hmm. uh, how to create your elevator pitch. So it's kind of like, you know, and going forward into 2023, I kind of want to really focus on like, there's no one right way. I mean, I have been focusing on this, but there's no one right way to do it. So it's more going to be like workshops that give us like self exploration, you know, and like, Mm -hmm. here's all the different ways you could do it. Now, like you go figure out which one works for you, or let's help you figure out which one works for you. And then, yeah, yeah. And then implement that. Cause that is, I think if I had one soapbox for she built this, it would be, uh, there is no one right way to do it. And like you, you can take in all the information and all the data and strategies and everything. But at the end of the day, like you have to figure out what feels good to you and what makes sense for you on paper. And that's a combination that may lead you in one way or the other. So, um, and then we also do in person, like in New England right now, and who knows what will happen in the future, but we also do in-person events, which you're going to be a part of in September. Mm -hmm. And those are like, I mean, I can't even really describe it in words. You kind of just have to be there, but it's like this really great energy. And, and what it is, is the energy of every single person, every unique individual, like that is coming to that room for a purpose and with their own excitement and their own like desire to learn and be curious. And they're like, just bringing it all into one place. So it's just like, uh, I mean, if it was a beaker in a chemistry lab, it would be dangerous. (laughs) Right. So like an event. So basically she built this is for, so the online group, people all over the, the world, all over the country can participate. And then you have local meetup events, um, And so there's a lot going on. I mean, the one that's coming up in September that I'm a part of on the panel is all about community. And you say community is the key to transformation. So I want to talk about that in a sec, um, what community means ultimately. But um, so there's kind of like the beginning of the event. There's like some, I'm not a fan, no offense, people. I'm just not a fan of like networking. For me, it's like hanging out and talking, getting to know people, genuine connections. So there's like a time before that. And then there's like a panelist, like a round table discussion of like five different entrepreneurs and you're, you're one of them as well. Uh, and then there's also, you know, and, and some, some great um, local people who, who are going to be on stage as well. 
And then there's also like opportunities afterwards to connect with the speakers and there's goodie bags and there's snacks and local vendors. So even in the creation of the event, um, it's not just like, well, you guys come and a bunch of talking heads are talking to you. It's right. very interactive. You bring in vendors from the community so they can share their wares and you know their gifts and stuff like that. So to me, it's really different than just come and you're going to get lectured at for like whatever, right? I mean, it's like connection, connection, and more connection. Yeah. Connection, collaboration, and community, let's say all in one yeah. spot. But yeah, I, to I totally agree with you. I'm not a fan of the word networking. I love relationship building or just yes. like, how about just ask people some normal questions? Like, just be normal. <laughs> just, be, just be like, well, have the experience of like human connection. I mean, that's what yeah. it really is, is like just talking to people and not just being like the dreaded. So what do you do? Yeah. It's like talk to people about who they are, what they love, what's lighting them up. What are they excited about? Like what's going on? You know, like and because I think that so much of those kinds of uh, or a lot of like, quote unquote, business events. Like I belonged to the chamber for a very short period of time um, back when I had a brick and mortar, like a yoga studio. No, I don't know if I belonged to the chamber. I belonged to the, ch it doesn't matter how it is. It had to do with yoga. It wasn't my studio, but I would like go to these chamber events and I would be like, this is just like dying a fucking slow death. Like people, I was just like, and I can talk to anybody. And I was still just like, oh, this is like painful. And cause all I want to do is just, talk to people and be normal. And they were always looking for that succinctly. Give us your like, who do you help and how do you help them? And what's the, what's the result? What's the outcome? Like, what's the, th and I was just like, look, I don't know if we can fit yoga into that tiny little box. I don't think we've ever been able to fit the work that I do into these really tangible, like bite-sized little boxes that most people do. And so I love kind of the setup of, what the She Built This events are like, because it gives people just some wiggle room to bring their humanity like into the room where it's not just like this structured, buttoned up, like suit and tie, or, like really strict and structured vibe. I mean, I'm hit in my, in my, oh yeah. Yeah. That is so not my, that is not my thing. <laughs> I can do it. I can play that game. I'm sure all of us can, but it's not fun. And it's not how you really get to know people in my opinion. Yeah. So let's stay with She Built This for a little bit. And then I want to talk about, quote unquote, Emily Aborn content creator. Right. Um, so tell me about um, what community means to you and when you say and why it's so important, like why why this whole conversation around community builds you up. So you you you're talking about this event that we're having in Laconia, in New Hampshire. It's September 29th, right? Yes. Yep. OK, so um, and one of the key things that you're saying about it is community is the key to transformation. So can you tell me what you mean by, by that? Okay. So I think what I mean by that is that when you're in a place where you feel like you can be yourself and you feel like you can be supported and you're accepted for just being you, you are able to expand and grow without fear basically like without fear of being judged without fear of being ostracized without feel fear of being rejected and it just gives you like just having that freedom to be able to grow is what i think is is transformative um and that is really you know like obviously transformation happens step by step right so every single time you kind of take another leap take another step that's how you transform yourself and i think having the community that's like cheering you on because they truly have your best interest in mind, not just cheering you on to be like your cheerleader. But oh, that like you go girl. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the community that really has your best interest in mind is going to help you make, take those steps and make that transformation. Yeah. So I remember, you know, you had said at one point when you're in the wrong community, you're not able to be free to like be yourself. Yeah. And it's not comfortable. Like that's not, you know, they say growth happens outside of your comfort zone. I'm like, well, our, our mutual friend Terry suggests that perhaps growth happens actually in your comfort, comfort zone. <laughs> I would say that it happens in both, but I think what, you know, the way Terry Trespicio talks about it is expanding your comfort zone mm -hmm. right so slowly learning to do things um but yeah i mean i think that's what she's saying and i and i love that point is that 
if you are outside of your comfort zone, here's the thing. If you sometimes stretch yourself, I call it like stretching yourself. If you stretch yourself and expand a little bit outside of your comfort zone, you often surprise yourself. You realize there are things you could do you didn't even know you could do. And it's just like, whoa. And then your whole consciousness expands, like your whole identity and how you see yourself. But if you're fucking terrified, if you're in an environment where you feel like I don't trust other people and now I think I'm in over my head, so I don't even trust myself. Yeah. Then that growth ends up to your point, right? I agree. Like it, 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 it really is much more unlikely that your creative genius is going to flourish when, because we know literally brain science that when you're in a place of fear, creative faculties shut down when the critic gets really loud. And so this is why, like going back to Clyde, when Clyde reflected back to you, your genius, your brilliance, your bubbliness even, right? Like I see you as a girl who's like this and you were like, oh. And then it was like the clouds pop, <laughs> the light shines down. It's like, here comes Emmeline, you know? Because I think that's what a good community does is that it, it gives you the space um, to really discover and come to know yourself. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And be that self. Well, right, and to like, and because here's the thing. Let's talk about the community, the very first community that everybody has, which is some version of family, even if it's dif dysfunctional, broken, guardians, adoption, like there's a thousand, like whatever. Because even if you're at, let's say you're in an orphanage or a home, that's still your community or quote unquote, the family that you have, even if that family changes every three months, unfortunately. Um, so those first experiences, like within that, you know, community, they're they're sh they're shaping us all the time and if where was i going with that how did i get there what did i jump off of do you remember you said let's go back to our very first experience of community yeah so our first experiences of community weren't always safe and we didn't feel like we could trust others sometimes not for everybody like some people grew up in communities where they just felt whatever but those first communities we often think the great thing let me put it this way rather than going backwards um a lot of us are brought up in communities that actually don't feel like a good fit. Mm -hmm. We don't actually feel like we belong. And what we do is we cirque to slay ourselves to try to belong. And I always say there's a difference between trying to fit in and true belonging. And I think what a lot of kids do is they try to assess the situation and figure out how do I need to fit in here to survive so I'm not bullied, so I don't get beaten, so I'm not abandoned, so I'm not rejected or judged or attacked or whatever. So there's a lot of contortionate, contortionism that's happening versus the, the gift of being an adult is we get to choose our communities. And I think that's a really good point because this community, any community is not for everyone, you know? And I think if you actually, actually, if you are creating a strong community with a with a purpose and kind of like a, a feel, let's call it, um, it's going to repel some people. And that's OK. Like not everybody has to be your people, you know, and I think that's important to realize, too. Like even when people come in, like you can sort of tell that they're going to leave because of the way that they're showing up. And it's just like, that's not really what we're doing here. But um, you'll, you'll figure that out for yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so that's okay too. And I think just having that permission, like for our own selves, some people might need to leave some things and unsubscribe from some things Amen. and unfollow some people <laughs> Amen. because that's okay too. Right. And cause, cause what we're, what you're kind of saying though, is creating is finding that community where you do feel like you are not trying to fit in. It's about finding the community where you feel like you actually belong because that's how you ultimately through genuine connection, through like-mindedness of purpose is that's when you start to feel that this community is something that builds me up rather than tears me down or exhausts me. Like there have been times like I, I, I'll go into a group sometimes, I'll just be in there for a week and I'm just like on the periphery. I'm just kind of like people watching. I'm watching the discussions, the level of conversation, the vibe, the energy, because here's the other thing. I want to talk about this, being a leader of a community, because leaders set the tone and shit rolls downhill. So I just kind of sit back. I engage, like I just kind of watch. And then I get to determine. I have a very, I'll get a very distinct feeling and I'll go, oh, no, 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 no. And I'm out of there. Like I just leave. And it's not a judgment. It doesn't mean those people are doing anything wrong. I mean, that's not for me to judge or say. 
I can just say it was a wrong fit for me or what I want or what I'm seeking or whatever. And I actually am not somebody who seeks out. It's really funny on a show about community. Um, I'm not really somebody who seeks out community. I think ne neither am I. I just I, create it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's what I did with the nest, you know, my spiritual community. Um, I created a community that I'd want to be a part of mm -hmm. rather than f seeking out other people's communities. And it doesn't mean I, cause I'm in, she built this, you know, uh, and, but you know, there will be people who, how do I say this? I have a really strong sense of myself. So I don't necessarily feel all that lonely or whatever. So when I join a group, it's because I really want to be there. I really want to interact with the people or what they're discussing like lights me up, like the gateless community. I'm like, yeah, I dig it. But I'm not like hyperactive in any other, any other communities except probably my own. Yeah. Yeah. No, that I would say that that makes the, or sorry, that is the same for me. And I think as a leader, if you, if you are a person listening and you're like, I want to start a community of my own. Yeah. I do think that like thinking about the vibe and the feel that you want people to have coming in is super important. Like you're basically creating a party, right? And you get to create any kind of party you want. It can be a uh, party with a disco ball. It can be like a tea party. It can be whatever you want it to look like, but you need to be clear on how you want that to feel. Um, I like mine to feel like a coffee shop. Like, like everybody's like buzzing in, buzzing out. They can stop for a sip or they can sit a while. You know, it's just like, I like that energy of a coffee shop. That's always been like my thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um. So that's sort of like how I want it to feel. And if that doesn't work for people, that's okay. And, and like I said, they can stay as long as they want or, or leave as quickly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, you're, you're right on point because I think what you're talking about is the experience that they're having. Like, what's the energy when they come in here, right? And you had a vision. You had this sense. I want it to feel like a coffee shop, right? But the community that you like to create is also reflective of you as the leader. That's what's really, I think, fascinating. There's, yes, it's for everybody, right? She built this, right? It's it, people, all kinds of people are welcome. But the heartbeat of it, what you might disagree with this and not even like what I'm about to say, but you are at the heartbeat of it. You are the originator of the space. You're, you created the container and the container is your responsibility. So if I came in to like just say, well, not say me, but let's just say some random person like joins the community, right? They're, they're in the Facebook group. It's, and how many people now? It's pretty big now, right? Yeah, I think there's around 1,700. Okay. So some, some, some person comes in and they start acting crazy. Whose job is it to handle mm, that? Yeah. Right. Mine. You, so you're <laughs> Hand raised. The, right. You're sending the tone and like that. That's why there are quote unquote group rules or etiquette or suggestions. Like whether it's no hate talk, no b bullying, no whatever, no putting random videos that nobody asked for, like whatever the thing is. So the, the leader is the one who sets the container. And so there has to be a certain amount of like, you know, the overseer. And if there's somebody who is like, uh, how do I say this? A sense of self as a community leader doesn't mean you're perfect. Doesn't mean you don't have shit you're working on. Doesn't whatever. But you know, like when somebody, this is the first question, right? When somebody comes into the space, how do I want them to feel? Are you asking you, me? No, no. Yeah. I'm, oh. Well, I'm saying it. And then yeah. I want you to say, cause you said like the buzz, the coffee shop, but what did you really want? Let's go under it. Right. What did you really want people to feel? I want them to feel like this is their, this is their home really. Like this is their space to be themselves and to feel accepted and supported in what they're building. Yeah. So I want to talk about this because we talked about um, I made a few notes. I got a few notes here. I should say, yeah, it doesn't matter. So here, here are the notes that I wanted to discuss. And I'm just going to read the first ones and then I want to dive into the second ones. In relation to community. So without community, here are some things. Always feeling really alone. Okay, even, even in groups. And that's something that kids with like, we can go back to like in, in my work, like kids with trauma. It's like you can be surrounded by a lot of people and you still feel lonely. You can, you can feel unseen, unheard, like you don't belong even in a group. So without community, you can often feel alone. 
in a wrong community, you don't feel like you're safe. You don't feel free to be yourself. You don't feel like you matter, right? And this can also be the feeling of, I can't, I can't trust the people here. Like this is not a safe place for me. Now, here are some notes that you shared with me around with community. And I want you to touch upon these. Um, you, you said you can go further faster. So tell me what you mean by that. Yeah. So like with a collective brain, okay. So a couple things. So first of all, with the collective brain, like there are a lot of people that have been through what you're going through right now. And so chances are high that what you're experiencing, someone else has experience with. And they can help you move through the ruts and through the challenges and, and pass the obstacles faster. Um, at the same time, there's also resources like within the community that are that are available to you. So again, like it's pooling our resources together to help us to go further faster, even apart from just our our brains and experiences. Um, so that's what I meant by that. Like, you know, doing it on your own you will get there probably in more time. And that's okay. Like that is mm -hmm. absolutely okay to take that path. This is going to help you reach your dreams a little bit faster. Same thing with spiritual mentorship. That's one of the first things we say is that um, what a spiritual mentor does, it's almost like, you know, when somebody is, is climbing a huge mountain, they go off on an expedition, right? They hire local Sherpas. They hire, hire local experts because this is what I say. They're the ones who know. This is when you need to get your oxygen refilled. This is when you need to take a nap. This is when this is where you can go to the bathroom behind the bush. This is the place where a lot of people fall off the cliff. This is when you need to anchor your line. So what a good mentor does, a good, especially from I can only speak really from my point of view, uh, my experience is that, you know, we save you time. What spiritual mentorship does, and I think what all good mentors, mentors do, and what you're now saying collectively as a group, when there's that hive mind and you're tapping into the experience and the wisdom of people who have come before you, you can get further faster. That's yeah. what I'm hearing. Okay. And then you say, yeah, there's tools and resources, right? Because there are people, sometimes you can get an answer from somebody who's done it before you, somebody who's walked the path or paved the way, and you still might need to navigate things on your own, but you said it makes it a shit ton easier when you're a part of a community. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Still stand and, by that. Could you? Oh you know, yeah. You know, on the Karen Kenny show, we reserve the right to change our minds. So like, I can change my mind, but I stand by that one for right, now. Great. <laughs> and then you say there's bigger impact when we're together when we're with community. Yeah. So even let's take the the Laconia event as an example. I've done a lot of these events, um, and I've done three, I think, completely on my own. It is really hard to get the same number of people participating in an event when it's just me trying to do it. But when I have collaborators and participants and like people helping me spread the word, I can make, I can get more people involved and more people then ripple effect out and we make a bigger impact. Did that, did that make sense? It was yeah, a little, well, I mean, think about, imagine, uh, what do they say? Um, I don't know this. I don't know the, the the exact saying, but it's like, you know, more hands make the work easier. It's like when you're trying yeah. to like, I think about like, I think it's the Amish when they build a bond and the whole community comes together and they get that sucker up in like a couple of days because everybody's coming together with their tools, with their knowledge, with their, and Dave knows how to do the hammer and this one knows how to do the framing. And you see them. Imagine you're one guy trying to raise that barn wall. But when you have 15 people and a guy with a pulley, so we build things together easily. I mean, you know, and this is the thing. There are some things, right? In my line of work, I say, nobody can do th that inside work. Nobody can do that for you. Yeah. But the good news is, is you don't have to do it alone. And this is like a different version of that where you're saying like this business, this, be this sometimes exhausting, overwhelming, stressful, but glorious experience of, of having your own business you know, men, it, 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 it makes the work lighter. It makes the hat lighter. Um, again, there's some things in your business that you just have to feed into the fire. Like you got to do it. Nobody can do it for you. Um, and one more piece on that is just yeah. like the, the ripple effect of being a human being connecting with other great human beings. Like, I think that the more you surround yourself with the right people, it just like, like, 
I'll use the example of when I saw you and all of, and a couple other, she built this members last Friday. Like I left with like a, like a greater excitement and a greater joy and a greater energy. And then that's just like rippling out, out to the next person I go to when I go to the gas station and get a pack of gum or what, you know, like that's just spreading. So the more you surround yourself with the right people, the more that you can keep on making a bigger impact in the world because you have the energy and excitement to do so. Because right, because if when you get around people that build you up instead of tear you down, yeah. you almost feel unstoppable in some ways. You feel more inspired and motivated, and you know, called to your purpose. You know, one of the things that I was um, thinking about because I know in the past, like I've talked about how like you know, community is a verb, and people are like, well, what do you mean by that? Oh, it's really easy to join a fucking group. Any knucklehead with with a computer can do join group and then answer what's your email address and whatever. But to truly have the experience of community, you have to participate. So I've been kind of thinking about this. And I'm like, for me, and my answer to what is community, like, I'm like, how much time do you have, right? It's so varied. But for this little snippet, I will say, for me, it often involves people, place, connected purpose and participation. And mm -hmm. without the participation piece, there is no community. You know, if you just sit on the sidelines and you're like, oh, I never, I never yeah. comment or help or get involved. And, and also if you're in a community where you're always a taker and you're not a giver, because I've talked about this too. Is yeah, that, don't even get me started. No, I, no, let's get started. <laughs> let's get started. Let's dive into that because I'm like, you know, I go back to, you know, St. Francis of Assisi is one of my favorite saints and because he's a patron saint of animals uh, and the environment. Uh, and he does the blessing of the animals every year. Well, he doesn't. He's dead. But they do the blessings of the animals every year on my birthday on October 4th. So he's like my guy because he's a, he's an animal lover. And so um, where was I going with that? Um, oh, so one of the things that he always says in his famous prayer is it's in giving that we receive. And I really believe that. But I think a lot of people come into a community and they're like, what can I get here? What are you going to give me? What, 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 you know, why should I join your group? What am I going to get out of it? And I'm like, you've already lost then. You, you did not come in with, with the right mindset. So let's talk about this. Since whenever somebody says to me, don't get me started, I'm like, no, let's go. <laughs> we can do it for like five minutes if you would like to share. Okay, first of all, if you're that person, don't think no one is on to you because we're all watching. <laughs> um, and, and that is true. Like, I think we all can probably pull to mind somebody that exhibits this kind of behavior where they are a taker. And it's just such a turnoff. Like instantly, I'm like, well, I don't want to do business with you because all you are doing is showing up when it's time to promote your thing or when it's time to plug yourself in this comment, you know, and I, I think that is one thing I'm definitely on the lookout for often in my community. And I don't, if people promote in the wrong place, obviously I'm going to remove it. But if people do that, like I'm not doing anything about it. It's the community that's going to speak for itself and, and not want to participate with that kind of person. So, but when it comes, I mean, I don't, it's hard. I'm, I'm a giver at heart, but like, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily recommend my MO to anybody else. Um, because I think sometimes I overgive, uh, but I do think that when you come into like a relationship with what can I give rather, what can I get? Yeah. It just, it, it just, it takes the pressure off. I think, I don't know. I, I, I don't have a good answer for that right now, but I will. <laughs> no, I think you're doing a fine job answering. I think you're making total sense. It's like, if you come in under the thing of everything just being transactional. And if you're coming in, just wondering what you can get out of it. And, and let me tell you, uh, it's the same thing. Like I, I'm not somebody who just, uh, somebody asked me the other day, they were, t they were talking to me and they said, so you're not a cheerleader then. Cause they, a lot of people mistake who they think I am or whatever, or how they think I might be based on the way that I talk, my accent, my potty mouth, like whatever. And I said, oh, no, 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 I'm a huge cheerleader. What I'm not is a bullshitter. Mm -hmm. So I'm not just going to be like, oh, rah, 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 sis, boom, ba about shit that I'm not like cool with. And what I see a lot of times, especially in female communities, like communities that of people who identify as women, is a lot of times we were raised as to be nice, to not be mean, 
right? To, to We hate hurting other people's feelings. We hence, hence, a lot of us tend to overgive, right? As you were saying, right? So one of the things that I find in communities is it's really important that when, like you said, the community will speak for itself. So the leader sometimes doesn't always have to be the one who's putting the kibosh on a thing or whatever, because what will happen is, is that people will naturally be repelled by that mm -hmm. behavior. Mm -hmm. They'll retract from that. They won't want to engage with that. And one of the, I'm finally going to make my point. I always take the long way there. But one of the things that I see a lot is if somebody makes a post about something they're going through um, or something they're sharing, a question that they have, and you always find a way to bring the conversation back to you, or if you always find a way to make it about you, a lot of times the sad thing is, is that people don't even subconsciously know that they're doing it. Now, I just did this the other day where somebody said, oh, I can't remember what it was. There's a difference between saying like, me too, because you're really excited. Like somebody said, like, I'll just make something up. Let's say somebody said, I'm going on vacation to St. Pete's. And I'm like, oh my God, I love St. Pete's. I came to love it because I go to this writing workshop there. Every year. That's like when you find ways to connect when you're saying me too. And like, yeah, I yeah. don't mind that. Like a little storytelling and going, oh my God, you know my friend Emmeline too. Like, that's great. But when you can just energetically feel that it's everybody, they're just always trying to make it like the me, me, me and more me show. That is naturally unattractive. It is like, naturally repetitive. Imagine if you had responded to that comment like, oh, I'm a writer and a spiritual mentor and I have a podcast and maybe you should listen to my podcast on your way. Can you imagine? <laughs> Something like that. That I think that's kind of, I mean, to paint an, an extreme picture, but yeah, I totally agree. And and people even do it in conversation, you know, and it, it just like, I'll notice it. Like, uh, if I'm having a, let's say a, a conversation with somebody that goes an hour or so, I'm like, wow. And they've just done it again. Uh, yeah. And we see it too. Like we see it too, when people will friend you and then within like hours a day, they're in your DMS trying to sell you something or promote yeah. something. And usually what they're trying to sell me is my own services shit that I already do. So I'm like, you clearly didn't bother. And I am so fat. I have no, I'm so fat. I will just unfriend your ass like so fast. I don't care if it hurts your feelings. I don't care. I'm like that, that is, and, and some people might say, well, why don't you explain it to them? It's like not my job to educate every asshole in the world. Not that you're an asshole if you do that, but you know what I'm saying? Because there's a, a thing of, think about the energy that you're trying to create in this group. And sometimes people have to learn the hard way. And sometimes, sometimes I have compassion. We're all clumsy at some point. We don't mean it sometimes. I always say sometimes in my enthusiasm and my desire to be helpful, it maybe, you know, can feel a certain way. None of us are perfect, but we can all usually sense what somebody's agenda is. Yeah, there's a big difference. And, and you know what? It goes back also to your point about networking. And I think why a lot of networking feels so wrong or shysty to, to you or I is that it is just about like, okay, well, what can I get out of this? You know, like what, let's give the business card and then we'll get the referral. And like, that's the next step. So I think, yeah, there's well, a level think, of, yeah, uh, go ahead. Finish your, finish. No, your. no. I was just going to say, there's a level of that that shows up in that arena too, where it's like, ugh. yeah. Well, even think about the intention there. They're doing that because they're trying to quote unquote, get clients yeah. get referrals. And here's the thing. I'm always listening for who that person is and what they really need because it might not be me, but I know somebody. I know somebody who could help them or whatever. But if you're not actually listening to people and if like, here's the other thing, if you're, if here's the other thing, it, it's bad etiquette to be listening, but looking over their shoulder for the next best or you know what I'm saying. <laughs> it's like, because I do think, I think communication and connection is an art form. It is a skill set, and not everybody has it. And, you know, but you can learn it. You can learn it. Yeah. You can. Yeah. And I think that she built this is the perfect safe place. Like, um, you know, especially the in-person events to actually have a real life experience of that. So if you're listening right now, if you can hear the sound of our voices and you are in the New England area and you are looking to connect or maybe your business is at a place where you just want to kind of like stab yourself in the eye or bang your face off your desk because you're like, oh my God, I'm so tired of trying to do this on my own. 
come to the event on Thursday, September 29th in Laconia at the Lakeport Opera House. What, five to nine? Five to nine, yeah. Well, five to eight for, for by the time this comes out. <laughs> five to eight, but five to nine. So that extra hour, I don't think there'll be any VIP tickets mm -hmm. left by the time this comes out. So, but uh, I don't know, roll the dice. Maybe there will, but we, we would love to have you. Um, I, I also want to mention, because I thought this was kind of funny, you and I talk sometimes about... Uh, human design. And so if you don't know your human design, human design is kind of, I, I just think of it as another tool or um, framework to kind of look at yourself and who you are. And you may not remember this exactly off the top of your head, but um, so I'm a generator. You're what's called a manifesting generator. And so we, you kind of talk about it like, well, community is in my blood, like community is, in, which is another way I would say is community is like in your design. So do you remember, um, like what it says, or do you want me to read to you what it is? Yeah. So there's a piece of it. And I just learned this recently, um, but there's a piece of it that talks about like your best environment. So like the environment you're always cultivating and, and creating and like the environment you're, you're brought here to do, to create yes. basically. And yeah. mine is markets. And it's just, it's, I mean, you can read it exactly. Cause I think the way they say it, it's like, holy it's crap. Perfect. Yeah, it's yeah. perfect. So yours is a manifesting generator, your, your environment that you thrive in and feel called to is markets. So these are places where there are people coming together to work, whether it's literal or virtual, you thrive in the activity of a group with common direction. I yeah. mean, you just live, basically, <laughs> you're living your best life. You're living your best life when you're like, when you're in that. And it's like, you know, um, so I, I like these other things too, that we kind of discussed, right? Which is like, so what does it mean to be a leader of community? And one of the things you said, which I, have been saying, I'm not, I'm not trying to like one up you or anything like that, but something I've been saying for a thousand years as a yoga teacher, right? So a leader does not mean to be a creator of a bunch of mini me's. This isn't right. about becoming anybody's guru. So when you're in the leader of a community, it's like, you know, uh, that is not the agenda. And for me, it's also to not create uh, relationships of codependence. That is not interesting to me either. Do you have anything you want to expand on about that? Well, first of all, don't be my mini me. You definitely don't want that. <laughs> but no, you know, it, it's, it's, I guess, going back to that, like original conversation we had around religion, I think that can sort of be the, and not just in, in Christianity, there's other religions that I think the goal is to kind of be like the guru or be like the teacher, or be like the expert. Um, and that is not this, like I, I, everybody gets to be their own flavor of whatever they are. So. I hope that answered that question. No, it does. I mean, because that's okay. that's where I was leading to is like if you were going to give advice to people who were coming into um, communities, I know one of them is, of yours is like to just be yourself and allow yourself to be who you who you really are. Are there any other things, any kind of advice or wisdom that you might share to somebody who's thinking about joining your community or a community? I think ask questions and participate, like don't just, well, first of all, you know, follow the rules and the boundaries and the guidelines, like make sure you know what those are because you don't want to be that person that does it. Act here's what, ha here's what sometimes happens. Sometimes someone will do it because they simply don't know the rule. And then I'll say something and then they feel bad about it. And I don't want them to feel bad. I'm just like, no, I just want you to understand the boundary. So it, you can help yourself and you can help the the leader by just like knowing what the rules are and what the boundaries are. But then once you know, like, don't be afraid to jump in and participate and like take the first step that can feel scary, right? Like, especially in a group of 1700 people, you're like, oh my gosh, what if I say the wrong thing? But you just have to kind of start and take that first step and ask that first question. And then you'll sort of like build that trust in, in the community around you and also in yourself. Yeah, there's something I want to say, and I want you to just maybe speak to this for a second. One of the things that happens, especially, so one of the the unfortunate things about building communities on Facebook is that while they are our communities, because I have the nest too, right? Yeah. Um, but Facebook basically owns those communities. And what mean, what that means, and I think this is important, and you might have your own little story of this. What that means sometimes is that we are sometimes at the mercy of algorithms, so if you're in, especially if you're in a large group and you don't tag anybody, if you just ask a random question, it's really easy for the algorithm to not pick it up. So if somebody comes into a new group, a large group like yours, mine is a private group. So you only get that group through, you know, paying and working with me. Yours is a free group, right? 
right? Yes. I, I, yes. I but still, pr miss... still private. Yeah. Yeah. Private, but you know, but I want to just be clear. So if anybody thinking to join SBT, she built this, it's, it's free yes. uh, to participate. Mine is a, a paid, but, um, what I was going to say is sometimes you'll post something, you get really brave. Like you're saying, you just got to jump in, you get really brave and you post, post something. Then it's like fucking crickets because sometimes it's like, the time that you posted, you didn't tag me, whatever. Do you have any words of encouragement for somebody if that happens to them? Um, try again. <laughs> try again in with the same words, with a different picture or a different, like a different way of asking the question and you might get a different result. Or like you're saying, tag somebody. But as a leader, if I see those things happen, I'll try to make some sort of comment or tag somebody. Like if I don't know the answer, I want to help that person out and find them because I don't want anybody to sit there and be like, well, nobody answered my post. So, um, yeah, I always try to, to jump in and do that. And, and as a group, as a community participant, you can do that too. You know, if you know somebody that has the answer, tag them so that the, it's not just sitting there. Yeah. So what, what I'm hearing is this is a collaborative effort. Yeah. The key word is community. So if you're feeling alone in a community, part of it is we also, we have to take personal responsibility and say, how am I showing up? What am I doing? How can I do this better? Um, sometimes though, it's like the first inclination is to feel bad, to feel unseen, to feel, oh, this isn't for me. And it's like, no, 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 try again. And that's what I say to people in the nest all the time. If you're going to make a post that really matters to you, yeah. tag somebody so they see it. And I'm just like, you know, and I'm one person and there's many of you. So it might take me a day or two to, to get around to it. But if, if, if you wanted my eyeballs on something and, and, you, and um, you, know, you didn't tag me, tag me. Like put it in the comments so that I can see it. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I love your very straightforward advice. Try again. And I would add, help yourself. You yeah. have to play a proactive role in being a part of a community. It goes back to like community being a verb. You know, you are a part of it. You are not an outlier to be a part of it you must participate and it's a two-way it's a two-way street <laughs> it's a hundred percent a two-way street um and then i just want you to um tell me you said also in community we're building it together but that doesn't mean that you're everything to everyone what do you mean by that Oh, this is something I am learning literally every day is just like a lot of people come to me with suggest. Okay. And this happens to community members too. Like a lot of people are going to give you suggestions and feedback and thoughts and ideas. You do not need to conform and do all of those things. And people give me feedback on like, this is how you should do the group or like, this is what you should do. Wait, and wait, unsolicited. Oh, well, both, Fantastic. both, yes. yep. okay. but, um, and so I have to look at that first, if it is unsolicited, like, how do I know this person? Why are they giving me this feedback? Did they have a negative experience? Like what's going on here? And then second, is this something I actually want to implement? Somebody recently came to me with a piece of feedback that like I reacted to, and I was like, no, I would never do that. That's stupid. And then I thought about it for a little while and I was like, oh, that's actually really like, I'm going to try that and see how it goes. <laughs> and it was great. So that's another piece of it too, is like taking in, like, you're not going to be all things to all people, but sometimes like other people are seeing things that you're not seeing. So allowing them to reflect some of those blind spots, it can be yeah. really, really valuable. So, but, but that is what I'm learning is like, you know, I don't spend a lot of time in other communities for the reason that I don't want to be like other communities. I don't want to do what other people are doing because I'm not doing that. So sometimes when I spend time in there, I'm like, oh my gosh, I get all this comparison. Like, should I be doing this? Should I be doing this? Should I be doing this? And that is not, you know, like stay in your lane, Emily, pull back okay, over. This is, this is a perfect segue because, and I know you have to go shortly, but I, I, I would be remiss if we didn't talk about this. This thing about staying in your lane. And we talked, you know, mostly about um, community today because that's what this, this episode was about. But you also have your other side of your business, which is your lane, which is Emily Aborn. So, and I don't want to, so I'll call it creative services, content writing, whatever. So tell us a little bit about that because there might be somebody who's listening who could actually use your services. And one of the things that is really fascinating, I think, is in community, we're giving all this advice or you're sharing a lot of points of like, be yourself, be yourself, be yourself. But one of the facets of what you're really good at in Emily Aborn Design is taking on the voice of other people and helping them to shine <laughs> in their expertise with their content and their writing and stuff. So tell us a little bit about this other piece of, well, I would say the main piece, like 
you know, I would, I, I mean, personally, I love community and all of that, but I'm, I'm also just fascinated about this individual curriculum that you have to help others in this way. So tell us about Emily Aborn, the business. Well, thank you. Yeah. So it, it really is just called Emily Aborn. Um, I mean, it's a DBA on paper, but that that's neither here nor there. Uh, yeah. So I help women entrepreneurs who are passionate and motivated and like want to do the work, you know, like we're going to work together, but there is a level of implementation and I help them to put basically like all the ideas sloshing around in their head and, or all of the content ideas that they have into their voice and into words that then get them visibility. Because if your words are just sitting in your head, they're not doing anything for your business. And I want to bring it actually back to community because I do believe that your words can create community. So like, I believe that the words that you share in your marketing and your messaging, like those create a connection with the person on the other end. And so like, like the words you use in your marketing and communi communication bring in the right people. And then you start building that community. So yeah. it's kind of full circle. Um, and I think what I like, you know, that's why I love hearing so many stories and so many different voices is because I love to like learn about that just as much as I like, I mean, I like using my own voice too, but, um, clearly, <laughs> but, but I love learning about other people's voices and other people's styles and like, how can we, yes, like, how can we get more of that? You know, like that's the magic in that. So let's bring that out. And I love when a client, like I'm working with an interior designer right now. And at first she, she seemed sort of buttoned up. Like she was like, you know, kind of like, Susie, <laughs> Susie, the interior designer, you know, I'm a little bit serious. And then she, she got the tone check back. Cause I submit like a, is this your voice? Does this sound like you? And if it does, I'll keep going. So she gets it back and she's like, I think it could be a little more quirky. And so then I sent her like, you know, I was like, you know, I don't usually do this, but I'm going to send you a revision. And we have had such a blast since then because she's getting to put her own personality yeah. into it. And I love working with a person that's like not afraid to say, this is what my personality is. And like, I want it to sound like me because there's nothing worse than going to a website and you're like, oh, that's not what I thought you were <laughs> when you get on the call with them. Yeah. yeah. I always say what you see is what you get with me, right? Like, so you want your words and what you're representing face forward to also be the experience that they have when you connect in person. So are you taking on any new clients right now for that kind of work and projects? I will be in October. I'm actually working on my own website right now. So yeah. I got some, I got, I got to figure out my own branding and messaging. Um, but yeah, so yeah. in October I will be. Yeah. And you've worked with a variety, like a ton of different kinds of businesses. So anybody who's listening to this, if you think like, oh, she can't, like you've worked with everything from what to what? Like, like a sandblaster to, to a hypnotist. Like <laughs> Yeah. So there's a wide range of uh, being able to do it. And really what you're doing is that very gateless kind of uh, approach of where the strength in the voice lies, where it shines, where you feel lit up, where the energy is and helping people to really, as you said, take that out into the world. So other people resonate with it, feel attracted to it, drawn to it. And they recognize that's my person or that's my community or that's, so those words do have the power to create community. And that's a really, that's a really beautiful thing. Yeah. I'll, right. I'll wrap. Okay. I'll share one quick story. No, on, yes, please. Yeah. I, I, you're looking at the time too, right? So okay. I be clear. when okay. I was, when I was six years old, I started a newspaper, like in my, in my little okay. neighborhood. Okay. And of the point of, did. yeah. And the point of the newspaper, like I was thinking about it recently. I'm like, the goal of the newspaper was to create community. And once again, like I just really, I think that drives everything that I do from the words that I help people to create to she built this. So I just wanted to tie that in because I think it just goes to show that like the way that we distribute our words really do bring people together. Yeah. And I love that you're helping people to do that because um, you know me, I love words too. And I think the power of communicating uh, in a true way about, you know, who you really are is that's how you find your people. It's that resonance. It's an energy actually, you can call it words, but the words have energy and power and impact. And, you know, so I think it's really fantastic that you help people especially female entrepreneurs to really um, find that so that they can, you know, find their people. And so with a few minutes we have left, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you wish that I asked that you would like to share? I don't think so. You asked me a lot of questions. Okay. Well, I just want <laughs> yes. to make sure it's always like, I never want to get off an interview and be like, rats, I wish we had said that. So is there anything that you want to share with people about like, 
how to find you, what's the best way to connect with you or contact you? Sure. Um, I think the best way to find me is to go to emilyaborn.com. And if you want to learn more about She Built This, that that info is there too. And the podcast is there. Like everything She Built This, you can also get to from there. But I think that's a good way to learn about who I am. And then you can see if like that's the kind of vibe you want to you want to hit your yeah. hit your cart to. And what if they <laughs> want to join uh, She Built This, the Facebook group? Yeah. So you can just type into your Facebook browser, uh, the search bar, She Built This. And I know that you're also going to have the link, but it's it, it's searchable. And then you just click join. And then I, you do have to answer some questions. Um, yeah. yeah. And if somebody local is listening, how do they get a ticket to the event? Shebuiltthis.org backslash lakes region. Lakes region. Yeah. Perfect. All right. I feel like there was one other thing I wanted to say. Oh yeah. Here's another thing. Emily has a podcast she built this podcast where she has amazing guests on talk about all kinds of stories and entrepreneurial and great topics and really helpful things. Um, and so they can find that on any place where you can normally find podcasts. Right. And it's, she built this. Yes. Find it everywhere. Correct. Yes. Thank you. You said it right. <laughs> all right. Fantastic. Well, Emily, thank you so much for coming on the show it's been a pleasure i i mean i feel like we could talk for hours and hours and hours but I at know. some point we gotta we gotta hit the cut off here so uh thank you for being on the show i appreciate you so much i love you so much and listeners thank you for tuning in i hope you come and join the group if it speaks to your heart and just remember like i always say wherever you go may you leave the people the place the animals the environment and yourself better than how you found it wherever you go may you be a blessing Bye. Thank you. Bye. Hey, you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the Karen Kenny Show. <laughs> I super duper appreciate your time, friendship, and support. And look, if something that I shared from my heart today somehow landed in yours, I'd love to hear about it. So please tag me on Facebook or Instagram or IG stories or wherever the cool kids are hanging out these days and let me know what your favorite pot was or what you found most helpful. You can find me over at Karen Kenny Live. That's Karen K-E-N-N-E-Y-L-I-V-E. -E. And if you're digging what I'm saying and you want to hear more, I'd be wicked grateful if you could go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review because you guys, that's how you'll help me to keep spreading the love. And if you can think of someone that could benefit from hearing this episode, please share it with them. I'd also love to stay connected with you. So if the feeling is mutual, please go to karenkenny.com backslash freebie and download my free guide to building your spiritual team. Until next time, my brothers and sisters, keep living in the fearless flow. Know that I see you, I appreciate you, and I love you. And wherever you go, may you be a blessing.